will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. With regard to public comment, during the public comment period, the chair will recognize members of the public. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name, preferred pronouns, residential address. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes at the discretion of the chair based upon the number of people who wish to speak. No speaker can cede their time to another speaker. The HRC will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. So um, welcome everyone. Let me call the roll. Liz Haywood is not here. Joy Eiffel? Could you confirm Sorry, that you here. are here, please? Here. here. Okay, Laverne? Joy Eiffel. Not here. Rizwana? Here. Deborah? Here. Tyler? Not here. Ronnie Parker here. Jacinta? Here. Uh, okay, we have a quorum, so let's get started. Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome to the Human Rights Commission. Um, let's just go down the agenda, then let's begin with uh, public comment, if there are any members of the public. I don't think there are any. I don't know. Is it a no? Okay. Uh, let's go around and do our member reports. Um, who would like to start? Okay, I'll just go around the box um, in front of me. So, Joy, do you have anything to report? I do not. Deborah? I do not, except to thank the DEI office yet again for another beautiful event. The MLK event um, on Monday was really lovely. Um, Jacinta? Nothing to report. Rizwana? Basically, there are uh, filled um, volunteer positions in uh, Housing Authority Trust and uh, several more also, and that is taking a long time. Basically, that's it. Okay. Laverne, welcome. I see you're here. Um, do you have anything to report? I don't have anything to report. Great. Yep. Um, so let's move on then to the um, um, just, action items. Before we hop into the action items, I just wanted to check in with Rizwana and see if she had anything in addition that she wanted to. She'd emailed us earlier today. Yeah. Us? Not me. No, you too. Yeah. I forwarded the email to you. Okay, yeah. Rizwana, go okay. for it. Yeah. Actually, I am uh, promoting um, a stance on human uh, rights uh, violations in Pakistan. And at that time, um, I had uh, approached everyone and uh, the procedure how I can make it a resolution has to be done with the, uh, with the signatures of uh, so many members. So I'm working on that. Actually, I have a resolution and I have... Um, written it down and hand it to uh, Liz uh, and actually to uh, all of you. So um, because of the fact uh, as a, a resident of, of uh, Amherst, I had talked to another resident also who, who also um, actually um, uh, wanted to um, actually uh, get, uh, support me in that because she said that a few years, uh, like two decades ago, when there was a problem in uh, Nepal, uh, Tibet, they had supported Tibet. So that was, at that time, they didn't have a town council or something. But uh, because of that, the name of town of Amherst came to the forefront. And when they visited uh, Tibet, Dalai Lama remembered the fact that there was a town of Amherst who supported them in their bad times. So he made a, he honored them when they went there and the relationships, the, you know, the interrelationships really improved. And that uh, also reflected on, you know, United States as uh, preaching uh, democratic values and also standing for it. And town of Amherst, the name became very 
um, global and um, it was honored. So that was a good thing because we are all um, basically, you know, municipal, there are issues and all that, but we are also global citizens. So I would suggest that uh, we look into the um, problems, human rights violations that are documented and just the fact that we just support it and record our uh, sentiments and uh, that will be pretty good because it will be part of the history. Yeah, that's it, yeah. And, and basically I, think... I have documented it. It's not just one political party is we, I'm talking about Christians there, Afghani is there, they are all, their human rights are being violated, media and so on. So it's across the board. It's not specific party that I'm looking at. So so it is very, um, you know, across the board. Viswana, did you want to talk about Tacoma? Yes, Tacoma right. is also- Right, that I saw, that <laughs> yeah. I saw. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I didn't know about the Pakistan part. This is a systemic issue that is still uh, right there uh, in the, the criminal justice system that will that is not contributing to the lack of accountability it is there's there's definitely a lack of accountability there and the police culture is still the same blue wall silence and they are getting um, uh, legal protections in, and then they when there was investigation and prosecution there was no prosecution basically they were they are being handed uh, you know 500k uh, in just just because of the fact that they have to resign. And so what happens is in the end, it's just not these details. It's just the fact that there's no public trust. Across the board, there's no public trust. And the lack of transparency and all of that strains the relationships with everyone. So it is not that it, it, only Tacoma is happening over here also. Uh, there is this, uh, I don't know whether you got to read that human rights score. We got the lowest score um, in, um, in, the nation, in the 10 cities in Massachusetts. And we, we earned uh, like 74 out of 100. And we were ranked 10. And the most uh, human rights, uh, we lost most of the points in the human rights. Because we, in the municipal, municipality also uh, we lost it as a town and then um, there was a transgender inclusive healthcare benefits that the employer assessment amherst uh, did not give and then there was not having a city contractor with a non discrimination ordinance so there was nothing enforced so there were no points there and then you we lost five points in municipal services that was LGBTQ plus liaison in city executive's office. So uh, why? You know why? Because we lost 10 points for having no liaison or task force in the police department. So right now, the issue is that all the leadership um, uh, positions in the town are vacant. So uh, when we, what are we expecting that the liaison is not there, there is no protection for any uh, uh, transgender youth or anything because somehow the leaders or the directors are not, not staying in Amherst, town of Amherst, it's because I think it's uh, what kind of environment is there that the, you know, the, the fact that there might be that too many uh, committees, there's too much of, uh, uh, I guess, discrimination because the middle school principal who was there, she also, resigned because uh, she was upset and then um, then the committees are not being filled and the police chief is not there so if there's no police chief the um, report also says the there's no um, you know there's no uh, policing also happening so they, they have that was very disappointing actually there's no inclusive workplace also over here so based the only thing that i think personally is working is the DEIA department. So, so it, it might be the fact that we have uh, we don't understand the budget and then there's unexpected um, connection or uh, unrealistic expectations of what we're supposed to do, but there's nothing going on. There's uh, no ground reality and the committees don't know that because the housing authority is the same, the, and the portals are still the, there. 
So uh, the leadership, there's a leadership vacuum basically. Um, this, and then non, the CRES is non-operational. The status is not uh, as, why is it non-operational? Because the two consulting firms that had recommended that these are the things you're supposed to do, they, that didn't happen. And then there's a interim school superintendent is also not really there. And uh, yeah, basically, uh, yeah, basically that's it. And and the justice, there's a tangle of ideas within the volunteer committee for community justice. There's so many of them. So, okay, that's it. So Pamela has her hands raised. Okay. Um, so I just so, want to clarify um, yeah. uh, what, uh, um, Hmm. Uh, one of the things that you that you raised. So I'm not speaking to um, the issues in Pakistan or Tacoma, but I do want to address uh, the allegation about the town not uh, meeting or are coming in tenth on the um, HRC. It's also an HRC. So there's a, um, an international nonprofit organization called the Human Rights Campaign that does an assessment of cities and towns across the nation um, each year, looking specifically around issues that are related to the LGBTQ plus right. um, community. When I started in my position, one of the things that um, actually the town manager tasked our, the DEI office with was raising our score because he could not understand why we are scoring so low on their assessment. So this past spring, in an effort to raise the score, we um, I contacted all of the department heads and said, these are the areas where um, the town is not scoring well. If you have any information about any of these topics, please forward it to me so that we can make sure that it is in the next report that's going. And I would say, so there are some areas where we don't like there is no one who is assigned to be the LGBTQ liaison in the executive office. So that that's um, an area where we don't have, um, um, you know, a way to respond to that. But many of the other things that you, that you mentioned, we actually do have in place and submitted it to the HRC and still received the low score and and we're actually at a, a bit puzzled because many of the questions so for example the question about whether there is um uh health insurance that is provided for partners actually contacted our insurer supplied that information it would be the same as pretty much the same as other municipalities in the commonwealth and for some reason it's not being registered um with the way I don't I don't know what what went awry, but are the actual things that are in place in the town do comply with the vast majority of the survey questions? So that's something that we are definitely you know that as the uh, the town manager is very concerned about, and um, we made every effort to supply them with uh, the information to show our compliance. Like the other thing that you mentioned was non-discrimination in the contracting uh, procedures. Yes. Submitted that to the organization, but I, I don't, I'm not quite sure what the dis yeah. disconnect is around, around that issue. So Jen yeah. and then Deborah. Wanted to give a little bit more clarity and background to the Tacoma story. I don't know if people know about it or not, but it was the, the three police officers who are basically being accepting $500,000 mm -hmm. after being on trial. I just didn't, I just wanted to, because Rizwana had reached out and asked if we could put that on the agenda. And so I just wanted to kind of clarify that because you had a lot to respectfully say and so i just wanted to make sure that was understood yeah no, i think i think that was really important because this is very important uh, detail on the news that came out because the persecution and the, the case had ended and the results were very unexpected so that was quite uh disappointing 
So I we we need to uh, keep that in mind that things are still not fair. So uh, what should we do? Should we say something or mm -hmm. have some resolution? Okay, I'd like to give the floor to Deborah now. Deb. Um, thanks, Ronnie. I'm just wondering if there's a way to not just wonder why the HRC didn't um, acknowledge the factual information mm -hmm. and if there's a way to follow up and who would do that, yeah. that would be great. Yeah. I just want to say as a queer person in this town, like, uh, that's not an area where I think we're falling down. I think, our, you know, there's a whole lot of issues that immigrants and refugees and BIPOC people, um, BIPOC. you know, could raise, but yeah, that's just not one of them. So I'd love it if that could be turned around. And as just as a matter of protocol, I know um, it's hard for me to respond to things that I'm hearing in a description without having any written documentation. Like, I don't know if we should say something about Tacoma because I haven't read this information and I haven't, you know, thought it through. And I, I, I think, um, no, I'd love us to do something. I'd love us to do something concrete and make a difference. And I'm wondering what the right process is for that because mm -hmm. like, I am confident that every city in this nation has a heinous thing going on that we could make a, 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 you know, make a statement about. So one of us sees an article about Tacoma. Should we make an, you know, a statement about Tacoma? Um, what about the 700 other municipalities, <laughs> which nobody happened to read an article about? So I'd love us to have a systematic approach to that. And I'm really appreciating, uh, Rizwana, that you brought this to our attention. As far as I'm concerned, we certainly can do something about Tacoma and Pakistan, um, but I would love to see the information too. Thanks. Pamela? So um, I reached out and will continue to reach out to the HRC. Um, I actually, when I submitted the initial response to them, wrote and said, like, if there's any question about documentation, and then I I, um, I did not receive a, an immediate response back to them, from them, and like two days before the deadline, then got a response. So we scrambled really hard, Jennifer and I, to gather more information and submit it. Um, so yeah, we, we'll definitely, and I will also say that the HRC, the Human Rights Campaign, um, to be clear, had a series of webinars in advance of the submission process for their survey, which we attended. So I, yeah, I don't know what, where the disconnect is, whether we're not wording things in the way in which they want it to be worded or whether it's not being presented in the way that they want it. To, I, I'm not quite certain what they're looking for. I would say that as a straight person, um, I do have concerns about the treatment of LGBTQ people in Amherst because of what I'm reading and hearing about in the schools and sort of ongoing little news and tidbits. And often when you hear little and you're on the periphery of the issue, it means there's more going on. So I sort of, I, I do feel that we need to pursue this. The thing that I see the most is really the BIPOC, the racial uh, piece in Amherst, but that's just what I see. Um, I do think, well, our next subject really was to talk about how do we come up with statements? Who writes the statements? How do we say this can go from the Human Rights Commission? What should be the statements? And in some respects, it seems unimportant because you're thinking, well, who cares what the Lammers thinks? But actually, we are who we are and we're part of this bigger system. We're not unconnected to the to larger society. And I think that when we see something, you know, big part of our job is to hear violations of human rights in Amherst. And so when we hear any violations, I feel like we should be able to put out statements about that and take a position and not worry that just because we're talking about one thing, um, we're not talking, we need to talk about everything that's happening in the world. We cannot humanly do that. But we should um, we should take positions at least as a minimal step as as a human rights commission. 
So I also, I was going to put forward two things. One is this whole question of deciding how and making state public statements, expressing our concerns about violations. And um, the second thing is, in terms of what we do, it's receiving complaints and how do we make that a more sort of meaty and meaningful thing for people so they can feel like they can come to us. That's one of the things we do that no other committee does. So how do we do that the very best we can? I think those are things, in fact, I would like to hear thoughts about and maybe from the people who haven't spoken first, Joy and Laverne and Jacinta if you have anything to add before we go back around. Do you have, like, are you, are you not interested or do you feel like it's, whether we do it or not is not that big a deal? Because all of those are, or do you feel like somebody else should be doing it because you don't want to be in the center of that? Like all of those are legitimate points of view. It would help to know a little bit because we don't want to go down the route of trying to do this thing and getting, getting votes and trying to get some kind of consensus if there really isn't an interest in doing that within the commission. I mean, I can speak for my, I am, I am interested. I think that we should, I, mean, I agree with what most people have said here. So that's why I really haven't chimed in anything else. Cause everyone's kind of saying what I, on my mind. Yeah, I think um, I'm just like a little, <laughs> I don't know if you can kind of see it, a little tired in the moment, that's all. Um, but in terms of, I think um, Deborah's uh, response really resonated with me um, about sort of data or just kind of like this, I always find it important to like share, not only just acknowledging, but also sharing information is really helpful. Um, and just, yeah, more transparency as Rizwana was saying too, like there just needs to be transparency all around. Um, and so for that, I, I I agree with Joy, I agree with you, I agree with everybody who wants to like okay. do something about the matter, even though like, I feel like local government in this scenario, it's really difficult to get things rolling. <laughs> um, it's a lot of baby steps, but yeah. Laverne, did you have anything to add? I was going to wait until Jacinta finished. But um, <clears throat> I, 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 well, I know I'm trying not to say what was already said, but um, so I kind of agree with um, Deborah and that like some of the things I really want to support, but I just don't have the information. Like, and same thing, like I just need to, um, I need time to think about things, you know, before I can respond about them. So if I get information in advance, like that would be helpful. So. so I'm just going to hold up on the hands just for a sec, just to not lose this thread. So it sounds like all of us want to be more engaged in what's happening around us, but we want it grounded in data. And it would be really great if each of us, when we see something that we think is important that the Human Rights Commission should act on, if we could gather the information about that and send it around. Um, and then at the next meeting, we can say, okay, here's a statement we want to make about this, you know, whatever the issue may be. Uh, if that's the kind of thing we could agree to, then I think it would be uh, really helpful in helping us to stand out and be active as a human rights commission. So then we'll go to Pamela and Rizwana. So um, you've said exactly what I was going to suggest, which is that as a protocol, you might want to agree that um, if someone has uh, an issue that they want to bring before the commission, that they send the background information and a uh, draft proposal or resolution to Jennifer and I to share. And if it's a local issue, 
something that would really need um, an, an immediate response, you might consider um, hosting, uh, having a special meeting so that you can be timely and in the moment. And if it's an issue that's not local for which, you know, you're making a political stance or standing um, in solidarity, that you hold that until your next meeting. Because, you know, for other issues that are non-local, you're not going to have a huge impact. It's not it doesn't have to be an immediate response, but you can still stand in um, um, in solidarity on a specific point. So that at least provides you with a protocol for how you might go forward. Ms. Wana. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Rani, because that was the problem I was having. I had all the documentations. I created everything resolution. But what I've discovered is because of the procedural complexities or bureaucratic, uh, there's a lot of inertia. So um, the fact is uh, I did send all the proper documents and the resolutions. So how do you go to the next level? Because there's one month, this is once a month meeting and then another month goes by and, and the information has to go to everybody. That is true. And the fact I just just I know I'm going here and there, but Tacoma, I'll just go back. Uh, Deborah was talking about and she was agreeing with us. But Tacoma is not a, uh, it's not happening very frequently. It was a specific case that uh, because the information came out in the newspaper, it was very horrifying. The fact the African-American who, who was walking, you know, it doesn't happen. It's not a common thing. So uh, the fact it should be flagged because he was not even doing anything and he was um, uh, just um, uh, put in a bag and he was, uh, he said, I cannot breathe and he died. It was very uh, clear thing that happened. He was not even, even a criminal or he wasn't even doing and he had kids and so on. So that was very uh, tragic. So this this is an ex not exceptional, but it is not that common. So okay, then uh, I'll just come back to that. And the other the thing is transparency. That is very important um, um, because Pam was saying about uh, the our town issues are very important because HRC we have a big challenge over here because of the leadership deficiencies we do not have specific leaders in the department like the schools and you all know how and that has really brought us down because that is the talk of the town or the state or whatever i don't know what is going on so the transparency transparency should have been there it's okay the workers if i go and meet them and they should say i don't know what happened and so on so that's okay but our leader, whoever is a town manager, someone should have uh, given us a statement as to what happened. Why did that happen? You know, and they should be uh, because the interim uh, uh, middle school principal, she was a very solid candidate. She was a doctorate and very uh, dignified and everybody was talking good of her. And why did she just go? Why didn't we protect? Uh, why didn't we protect her? Why didn't we give her the authority, empowerment? So if we do not give the empowerment to our the top people, uh, the the other the the problem that happened was with LGBTQD was that because there was no leadership and the the counselors were creating issue, and what had happened over there, we should have um, uh, actually we should have been told as to as a statement from the town manager or someone. So transparency is again an issue that is not happening. And uh, in HRC in our committee, uh, we will work on that. We can only work on that if we know what's going on in the town. Okay, Jen. Um, so similar to Pamela, I think when was Rizwana emailed us about Tacoma, but today was the meeting, and you can't change the well. You you can, but I knew that you nobody would have been prepared to do anything because nobody had that information ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So I I suggest, and I think Pamela as well, that she speak on it during member reports, and so. Personally, I would say, Rizwana, now would be time to go find a couple of articles and then submit them to us and then we can send them out. Okay. But the reason why the 
how to craft the statement and, and the process of that is really on the agenda is because things don't happen two days before I have to post the agenda, right? Mm -hmm. Like things happen the day after we meet and then it's another 30 days before. And honestly, there's some ish things that you could just, the statement can come out just, you know, then at sooner than a month, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a why it's on the agenda, but that's kind of the process part behind it is that okay. it would be good now for what all the different issues that you brought up to bring documentation and then we can forward it to the group and then people can do it but having a process for the statement is really important as you can see because things just happen at random times i think that's my point there then yeah i'm thinking that for uh if we're not having a special meeting that requires it because we need to make an immediate statement about a local event it would be good to say that we need to have all the documentation in, let's say, one week before the meeting. So that makes sure that everybody gets it, everybody gets to read it. And um, I love the idea of having both the background documentation and a proposed um, resolution at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I want to say is I'm well aware of uh, the trials and tribulations of uh, trans and non-binary students especially in the middle school, but in the schools in general, I was just responding to um, what Pamela was, the HRC's questions had nothing to do with the school system. They had oh. to do with the mm -hmm. town management. And that is what I was speaking mm -hmm. to. So chas uh, v'chalila, as we say in Hebrew, God forbid, anybody thinks that I'm not um, aware of that. I actually did some training with the school district um, to support awareness and understanding of how to um, support trans and non-binary students. The third thing is, I think it's great. Everybody, you know, if you see something, say something. And in my experience, when you have that kind of protocol, almost nothing comes forward. So I, you know, but when you have a subcommittee whose entire re reason for being is to scour what's happening and every meeting bring specific proposals, then that's more likely to happen. Even better if you have a staff person, but Believe me, I know that the two people who are in the DEI department do not have any more time to breathe, let alone take on another task. Just saying, sometimes when you disseminate the responsibility for something, not very much happens. So I wouldn't oppose it. I guess I'm just hope, hoping maybe there's a way to have more rigorous attention. Like, Right now, we're all invited to go and witness uh, or observe other committee meetings. I'm not sure what comes out of that. So if everybody who's observing another committee meeting instead focuses their attention so that every time we come to a meeting, we have three proposals you know, to make a statement, that feels like it's really concrete and there's people who have a job and they're gonna do it. And I'd vote yes for anything, but just a suggestion. Um, I feel pretty strongly that the proposals have to be, for me, have to be very well thought out and uh, substantiated, and I don't feel that one is needed every meeting or more. Uh, but I have no objection to having five or six or 10 if that's what we have. Um, in many ways, I see our commission as the subcommittee that you're referring to. Um, you know, we call on the public to come with complaints, to come to us with complaints, and very few actually come. I think that if, as we put ourselves out more, people will know more about us and be more inclined to come and talk to us. And uh, if you know, um, if you want, to, if anybody wants to form a subcommittee, that's fine. Um, I certainly would not object to that. But I do believe it's a responsibility of all of us as members of the commission, and we're only, we're not even ten people for the whole town of Amherst. Um, to be um, focused on human rights in Amherst and to see where there's something happening in the world and decide if that's something we as residents, as the commission in Amherst, uh, should have a voice. So I think uh, all of us should be bringing data and more than data, a proposal like what, how do you, how, how do I interpret this data and what do I, what does it mean to me and what do I want to say and what do I want the Human Rights Commission uh, to stand up for? And I see Tyler's here and he's got his hand up. Welcome, Tyler. Happy New Year. 
Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, I'm so sorry I missed the last two meetings in respect to this one, but um, so uh, you mentioned people bringing complaints to the HRC and I've been talking to other students recently. And one thing that's really struck me is some of the most egregious, um, I guess not necessarily rights violation, but violations in general. And I'd presume this would um, apply to rights violations as well, tend to be the sorts of things that a local government um, committee isn't going to be able to fully respond to, primarily things that will involve legal consequences. I wonder um, whether part of our outreach strategy should include providing resources to community members who, without necessarily needing to go to us, can just go to our webpage and see a guide to, if you believe you have been the yeah. victim of a rights violation, um, yeah. go to this resource. If for a housing violation, contact um, this agency yeah. or hire okay. a lawyer if it's of this nature. Yeah. For an educational rights violation, contact this agency. Potentially, we could even try to link to some resource that can provide um, legal support or legal aid, although I don't know how that would end up working logistically. But I think that that might be one of the most valuable venues for outreach that we could have and one of the most impactful, since that's probably where we can start to maximize our impact in this educational role. And also that raises our profile so people will be more likely to come to us with things that are within the scope of our charge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would welcome, I, I think that's a great idea and I would welcome comments from other members of the commission on this very concrete suggestions for suggestion for action. This is something that we would have to do work on. And I would do it work. I would work with somebody on it. Certainly. I think it's important. I'm wondering sometimes when you ask if people are, how people feel, if instead of waiting for a go around, we could just do like a thumbs up or a thumbs medium or a thumbs down so we could get a sense of the group. Mm -hmm. um, if people want to do a thumbs up, down or medium, please do so. Jacinta, did you have your hand up or do you have no? I just want to say that I think on the web page, if you, I'm on my phone, so I can't see the full page, but I think on the left hand side of the web page, there's a resource page that has links, all of those links, well, lots of links. So maybe you guys could start looking there first to see, and maybe, you know, to make it more engaging, it we move it from where it is instead of having all the other older statements. Like, again so but i think that that is already started on the page or at least at one point the page was set up with all of the resources to the left and it, it got really full and so we i thought we put them into a one link on the resources page um so but i, I can't so see that agreeing, part so we're agreeing for the next meeting that we will all look at the web page see what's there and um Maybe Tyler can coordinate, or if any of us have thoughts about how to improve that, what to add to it, that we communicate with Tyler as the point person for that. Is that agreeable? I, do, I don't want to lose what we've tried to talk about so many times, which is how does a statement get out? And I just want to clarify so we didn't lose it, that what we said is that if somebody feels a statement needs to go out, that they will do the research and they can, I don't know if it's, if it's appropriate, if the laws allow us to call up a colleague and say, I'm concerned about this, Deb, you know a lot about this. Shall we pull together this data package and write up a proposal and then bring it, submit it to Jen more than a week in advance so that it can be circulated and we can vote at the commission meeting. This is what I would really like to see. And it sounds like there's a lot of support for something like that. Is that feasible? And if you're okay with it, let's get a thumbs up so we can move on that. Yeah, I think that's a question for Pamela and um, and Jennifer. Is a committee member, Why? commission member, allowed to call another commission member and yeah. say, "Can you help me pull this together?" I hope so. I don't think so. Yeah. Does that violate the public meeting law? Most probably. 
So um, that was Rizwana who was commenting. I think if it's one or two of you, but it, there really shouldn't be more than that. And um, and it really, it is much better if you filter this process through Jennifer and I. So I think the process could should be really that you have an issue, that you do your do the research, you present your draft proposal, and you send it to Jennifer and myself, and we will send it to the committee and it will go on to your next agenda. And if it's a local issue that needs um, immediate attention, then we, you know there might be a suggestion to the two co-chairs that you have a special meeting. But that that gives you a process for 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 addressing everything. So just to be clear, if I have a concern, let's say about the LGBTQ issues, and I know Deb is right here, and she's got this expertise, surely I can talk to her and say, here's here's this article I've been reading, and here's what I've heard. I'd like to write up a proposal. Can you help me with that, or can I not? You so can't. if it's one person, like you, you can't meet in small groups, you cannot form a subcommittee. If you form a subcommittee, then that subcommittee right. has to abide by the uh, open meeting right. law. And so there has to be an agenda posted and public comment and all of that. So, but I can talk to one person. Right. Yeah. Call me Ronnie, please. Mm -hmm. I think Pamela's <laughs> frozen. Right. Frozen, she so chose a good time. <laughs> so am I still frozen? Can you guys, I can hear you, but. Yeah, you're okay now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Basically, I think what we have come to uh, agree is that there are two, three kinds of criteria that we need to uh, apply when we are making a statement. Yeah. One is for the local, one is for the global, and so there are two basically. Yes. Right. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter which, you would follow the same procedure. You would do your research, you would provide the yeah. data, you would propose a, an action or statement, sorry, or action. Does that make sense? I'm sorry yeah, but, to yeah, clarify yeah. when I got frozen, Pamela, I think we're saying that it's okay to talk to one person. Okay. Not okay to form a committee. So not mm -hmm. two people talk to one person. Okay. Great. So I feel like we sort of have um, agreement on that. And just to make sure, shall we get a thumbs up about the process for documentation or Deb, do you need to speak? I'm, I'm feeling a little funny about the whole thumbs up because in theory, that's a vote. Right, because if oh. half of the people went down and half the other people went up, then that would be open for discussion. So I think at this moment you could just call a motion to approve it. Oh no. yeah, yeah. Shall I make a motion then that um, we will we are in agreement with the protocol that's just been discussed, which is that each commissioner is allowed to approach one person or no persons, do their research, submit their documentation and proposal for a statement to the DEI office more than a week in advance uh, for discussion and approval at the subsequent commission meeting. Second. All in favor? Yes, I am in favor. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? None. Okay. Deb, you have your hand up. Sorry, I didn't see it before. Don't be sorry because it's about a another topic related. So I wanted that okay. to be complete. Um, and Good. it's about uh, people filing complaints in our town, which happens rarely, doesn't come to us, goes to the DEI office. We don't know who files them. We have no responsibility for managing them, except our committee is supposedly responsible somehow for that. So I'm just wondering, <laughs> Uh, like, what does this committee commission want out of the local complaint process? And can it be something uh, which the community sees as a service and as a, um, can we be seen as a place where people come? So I had a thought, not just a question, and it's not so much about handling the complaints, but I have a lot of experience in setting up 
community-based data gathering um, where people can, um, you know, fill out surveys and we can become aware of the kinds of things that are happening around town, not because they want us to handle them, but because we are collecting data. So if it's only about, oh, I'm gonna send you an anonymous uh, survey to tell you that this happened here and I just want you to be aware of it. So this merchant did this and over the course of a year, if we get a hundred complaints and there's 10 complaints about this merchant, it's not about us acting as a judicial or extrajudicial body, but we have information on hand of where there are, um, where it's challenging in the community, where folks are being, um, where folks' needs are being unmet or perhaps being discriminated against. Um, given that I don't see a way for us to get engaged with the actual complaint process based on the conversations we've had before, I was curious about whether data collection for its own sake um, to paint a picture of what's going on in the town would be useful. Amala, you have your hands raised. So I think that that's a really interesting question. And um, I, um, I I don't know if um, Ronnie was gonna talk about this earlier, but the town manager, it, has he established a date and time for the co-chairs to meet with uh, town council about the bylaws? Oh. And I think that that question should probably be a part of that conversation. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of far-fetched, but I think that someone could make the argument that the way that the bylaw is currently written, that, you know, the town has um, a very broad purview to look at all sorts of uh, allegations of discrimination. If And if you're collecting data, you know, and again, this is a bit far-fetched, but if you're collecting data, then you, somebody might want to make the argument that you have a bylaw in place, you're collecting data, why aren't you taking action? But I think it's an interesting question that could be a part of that conversation with, with uh, town council. I mean, with general council um, about, about uh, it, you know, if what, how could we, how could the town add, use information um, that it gathered in that way, um, given the fact that there's this bylaw in place um, about investigation and handling of complaints. Uh, I, I'll just clarify the way the data was used in other municipalities where I participated in this was that it created a picture that helped the municipality assess is there training that's going to be helpful in this you know environment? Are there um, accountability mechanisms we could put in place um, to call people to their best behavior? Is there, are there ways we can be preventative around these things? So it's, um, you know, it's kind of are the restorative justice things we could do. So it's not about like finding fault and then punishing, but, you know, there's a whole array of things that can happen um, beyond that paradigm. So, what do we need to do with this idea at this point, Deb? What would you like us to do with it? Do we want to think about this and put it back on the agenda next month? Or does somebody want to take some action with regard to it? Well, I'm happy to write something up so it's more cogent. Yes. I just know mm -hmm. that in the past, like we had this conversation about the actual complaints and how we couldn't really be involved and how that was frustrating and like so what do we do if it's if we're supposed right what do we do so I had this brainstorm for myself and I decided yes I'm happy to write it up and we can talk about it maybe at the next meeting and I think Pamela's idea uh, is great for bringing it up um, yeah to the town manager and seeing where that could go so um, we just to let you know where we are in the agenda, we haven't gotten around to all the updates and uh, some of this will be discussed too. So I feel like on the other hand, we've come to closure on some stuff that's been sort of nagging us for quite a long time. So now we know how to move forward on some of these things and we can see how we do with it. We'll have something to assess for ourselves. 
Um, so I'd like to continue down the agenda, but I saw a hand. Oh, it's gone. Is there yeah, a hand? Okay. Yeah, no, a... I mean, sorry, it's Rizwana. Okay, yeah. You want to give some closing remarks before we move on in the yeah, agenda? No, I am continuing with uh, what Deborah is saying about the service uh, with uh, the uh, the consultant's uh, leap. They had they already have all that data, and that's the reason they came up with the program for Crest and all that. So there is CAD. They use CAD CAD program, or they have a record RMS. Those are two programs. In RMS, they have all these questionnaires where whoever is in who goes and makes a complaint or something like that, they record that in there. So all the data is already there with the, they might be in the police department or with Crest people. So the data uh, um, collection is already happening. Otherwise, if it was not happening, they wouldn't be creating trainings. They won't be evaluating anything. They won't be getting any adjustments because if you do not evaluate uh, you know, without a if you don't have a data, you won't be able to evaluate anything, and then you cannot modify anything. So they, by the consultants and all that, I saw that data there, and so I guess if Pam or, or if you go ahead and find out from them, they have it. But their problem will be it will be anonymous. It 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 is privacy. There is a privacy tag to it, so we cannot they cannot share it with us. Most probably. So that's talking mine. about two different things. There mm -hmm. are complaints that are leap works in the law enforcement arena, not mm -hmm. in the general community arena, first of all. And what's true nationwide is that people don't make complaints to police departments about the police. People don't make complaints to the police department also about a thousand other things because the people who are mostly impacted by this don't trust the police. So what's been found is that if you have a community-based data collection system, which is outside of the police and outside of the town, like literally on a computer where the town can't track who's giving the information. So there's absolute anonymity assured and you do organizing and outreach around that. I mean, my experience in Portland is that they were the FBI and the police we're getting 10 reports or complaints a year about hate incidents. And once the com the coalition I was part of put together this uh, community trusted instrument, data collection instrument, we were getting 200 complaints a year. And I know that because I was in relationship with all of the community organizations who were serving all the targeted communities, that still wasn't anywhere near all of the data. So I think we're talking about two different things. I don't yeah, think the data is Deborah, you're right about that. But in this consultants, that uh, seven gen movement, the 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 ones that the town had hired, and they have a very comprehensive program uh, for Cress. Actually, they were the ones. They mm -hmm. I read all the. Um, interviews they had with uh, all different, I think, 32 people. So they, that was a kind of a survey. And then they came to the conclusions and so on. So it was not uh, about the police. Any police. Yes. I, I'm, okay. I'm intimately aware. I've read every word of the, every report. And there were 41 interviews. And it was all about the police. It was not about yeah. the municipality. We okay. really are talking um, about okay, the now, police. Okay, okay thank parts. you. Yeah, now it makes sense. All okay, right. so I think we are talking about Two different things and th yeah, this yeah. does okay. bring us up this does bring us up to updates because tomorrow there is a discussion about the cswg and seven gen reports and we'll be getting updates from the co-chairs of the um cssjc uh, at the league of women voters forum tomorrow and in fact that's one of the things i would encourage all of us to go to because we're looking for a new Crest director and a new police chief. And there's all this data that's been collected about how these came about and what they're about. And it, I think will be a good refresher to hear from people who were associated with it a few years ago. So if you're both okay with what Deborah proposed to do for next month, and certainly I'm okay, I think we're all okay with that. Um, let's move on to the updates. So let's go to DEI and Cress, and let's start with DEI. De well, both from Pamela. <laughs> okay. So, um, so Jennifer, if I miss something, um, please chime in. So we had a wonderful MLK 
junior event um, earlier this week that Jennifer organized. We were expecting about uh, 50 folks and there were 75 uh, people yes. in attendance for the community read of um, uh, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, lecture that he made uh, um, upon winning the Nobel Peace Prize. So that was wonderful. That was supposed to be followed on Tuesday by the National Day of Racial Healing, which is sponsored by the Kellogg Foundation. But due to weather, we canceled that event on Tuesday. And we are looking to reschedule a community conversation. And we're thinking that it might come at the end of February as part of the Black History Month um, events. So that's sort of what we're thinking. My goal today that I didn't reach was to email all of the folks, uh, some of whom are in this meeting, who volunteered to be as uh, facilitators to see if the date that we have in mind will work for you, because we can't do the event without the facilitators. The staff event for the National Day of Racial Healing will take place on Friday of this week, so um, the staff-only event. Um, other news, uh, um, you guys know for the last uh, first part of this year, um, we had an AmeriCorps volunteer, Asa, who had been joining our meetings. Um, Asa's tenure with the uh, office has ended, so oh. um, we are without Asa's help. Um, uh, we have plans to, and this should, really I should have said this in relation to the National Day of Racial Healings. So we look at the National Day of Racial Healing as a kickoff for our beloved community conversations around racial healing and um, rest reconciliation. The plan um, last year and the plan again this year is to have bi-monthly events on various teams around community building and racial reconciliation and healing. So our targets are February, if we're able to get, you know, the um, facilitators to for a date, and then April, June, August, October, and December. And Jennifer and I were talking today about what some of the various themes might be for those conversations. If you have suggestions for a topic that you'd like to um, propose, please uh, send it to us because um, I'm hoping that um, uh, you know we'll hold this February event and at that event, we'll be able to announce the schedule for the rest of the events so that we can start to build some mo momentum around, around those issues. Uh, we have, I think, a really exciting plan for our Black History Month. We are going to be highlighting four locations in town where our folks can visit and find out more about what I am calling the African-American experience um, in Amherst. Um, the four locations are going to be the Bangs Community Center where the Civil War tablets are held, Amherst College where there is um, the ongoing Ancestral Bridges mm -hmm. um, exhibit, uh, town hall where we, the DEI office with the help of uh, CRESS um, and IT and Jones Library are, uh, are creating a series of panels, uh, 20 panels that would highlight local history, um, um, feature some folks, uh, some residents. We know, I mean, just say publicly here, we know that it is not going to be 100% complete, right? We're not going to be able to tell every story of everyone that that should um, be told, but we're, we're striving for accuracy and we are going to create a process where people will be able to add additional names, additional things that we can, and can um, grow, you know, this collection of information about the lo local history. And um, although Jennifer is reluctant to take credit uh, you know, credit really has to be given to her for the the concept of gathering all this information. And she uh, worked with um, an archivist at the Jones Library to really pull this all together. And I, I think it's going to be fantastic. So, and if you've gone into town hall, then you know, typically there are um, different artists who have their work on display. And so instead of having a local artist have their work on display, the panels will be displayed in town hall for the entire month of February. And so we really invite everybody um, to come and see them. There'll be a flag raising on the 1st at 6 p.m. Or yeah, 6 p.m. And um, and then following that, you know, the 
our gallery exhibit, um, our panels will be, be on display. So um, we talked a little bit already about the bylaw, the fact that the town manager is arranging to have a conversation with the co-chairs about the bylaw. And I do think that's a great place to raise the question about around the community research um, or community data collection. Um, in addition to what's happening at the League of Women Voters, we also want to promote <laughs> our very own uh, uh, Rabbi Deb is going to be holding the Resident Oversight Board Forum tomorrow in Town Hall from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. And so if you haven't had an opportunity to come and speak and learn about the process of the Resident Oversight Board, we invite, um, invite you to do so. Um, and it's done, it will be hybrid, so in person in Town Hall and also available um, online by Zoom. And then the second forum, the last in the series of four on Sunday from 1 to 2 p.m. So that's a brief uh, overview, I think, of DI. And if I've missed anything, Jennifer, please weigh, weigh in. I just add something about those mm -hmm. forums. Since there's the League of Women for Voters Forum tomorrow night, come on Sunday and tell everyone about it. The information is on the website. Um, the goal was to gather as much in, uh, additional data as possible. We already have 45 uh, responses in, um, so that's great. And I know that there are more stories to be told. And the most important uh, point is to have specific stories of encounters with police um, so that we can gather as much data as possible about our community's experience with the police. Thanks. And Cress. And so Cress. So Crest welcomed uh, three new responders on Tuesday. So they've just started. We're at the four month mark for the leadership team um, on Friday of this week. Um, the we're at the one uh, Friday will also be the one month mark for the Crest Department going on to dispatch. Um, the uh, Crest Department has received an additional twenty five thousand dollars from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and uh, uh, um, an expanded grant to support two new uh, projects or um, well one new project and. Um, so one of the projects is looking into acquiring and training a comfort dog for the Crest Department. And the, um, the other project is uh, we've sought uh, some financial support to send the new director and um, teams that should include hopefully someone from dispatch if we're able and a responder to three different um, uh, municipalities in the country that have responder programs that are akin to the program here in Amherst. So programs that are not housed necessarily in public health, but are set up as a separate um, public safety department. So they'll have an opportunity to meet with, you know, colleagues who are doing the same work, who, um, who've been on dispatch and who are um, sort of dealing with very similar pro um, problems and, and questions about this work. Um, so we received the grant, I get this is where, so it must've been late December, um, but we are, we're, we're really holding on to those funds until the new director is in place. Because I, if, you know, the leadership team just felt very strongly that it should be the new director who, um, who is able to go on those trips and, um, and have an opportunity to, you know, build a relationship with responders have a relationship to um, build a relationship with their national colleagues, with dispatch. So I think once it's in place, it'll be, um, you know, that will will work out well and really prof provide uh, a great professional development opportunity for the new director. Um, uh, the I think there are four finalists for the Crest Director position. And the town manager is um, will be meeting with the, the four finalists next week. The um, new responders um, and the leadership team will also have an opportunity to meet with those those finalists as well. So um, I'm wondering, since the CRESS will have completed one month of dispatch, will there be any information available to the public about 
what they did, how effective it was, what Will there be some kind of report back to us? So we're planning on, I've been holding the data very close to the chest. Mm -hmm. And for a couple of reasons, one is because, you know, it's one month, so there's not a lot yeah, of, data of course. to report, yeah. but also because, and, and I should have included this, um, we would like to have an opportunity to take a look, like, you know, for the department, the Crest leadership team to meet with dispatch, to have discussions about it. And uh, um, and we're scheduled to do that next week. So we will start to, to take a look at, um, to see if there are any patterns um, and see if we can expand the the types of call types that are that, because we started with uh, a small, a limited um, uh, um, number of call types. I think we started with maybe seven, we've already added one. And so we'll have that conversation. So I think it, that will come. The other and uh, reason why I've held very close to the data is because, um, in all honesty, the data collection and the department was, um, you know, it just was not, it wasn't professional. It wasn't up to standard. And uh, a, now almost a year ago, the department received um, a report from the Donahue Institute at UMass with recommendations for how the data should be collected and reported. And one of the main things in that uh, Donahue report was that the, um, the department should use a software system called Qualtrics. So we have um, pursued the purchase of Qualtrics. Um, we just learned from IT today that it's, um, that we have a, a contract um, that will have to be reviewed by the finance department next week, but uh, we expect that to go through without any problem. And then once we have Qualtrics in place, we can actually have an accurate um, system for collecting data. So, you know, the, the, the department has been collecting data um, by using Excel. They also had um, a Microsoft Forms, uh, uh, process that they were using, but in all honesty, it's, it, you know, it's just inaccurate. It's not, it's, it's just inaccurate. That's the, you know, the only thing I can say about it. So we will certainly share some things that we've learned about, um, about being on dispatch, but it's, uh, I don't think you're going to, I don't think that the community will have really accurate data to review and examine until we've purchased the Qualtrics and it's been in place and the responders are all using it for some time. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna continue down here. The director search for the chief of, the search for the chief of police and Crest director. Um, I'll go first. I've been part of the Crest I represented us on the Crest Director Search. My role has been somewhat limited because I wasn't there in the beginning to, in fact, nobody was available to review the whole set of applications that came in. I thought the process was really good. It was somewhat flexible, which I think was needed because we were looking, not, there wasn't a cookie cutter we were looking for. We were really looking for a complicated a person who had quite a bit of range and depth at the same time. Um, so I participated in the, um, I think the first 12 interviews, I missed one of those, but the people who came in to interview with the larger group, there were additional interviews with some BIPOC candidates that uh, Human Resource and DEI did. Um, but in the end, the candidates, the four that were picked, I have to say, while everyone had their favorite candidate, everyone agreed of our group of eight or whatever number we were, quite a, a substantial group, um, everyone agreed that those were our top candidates. There was no doubt. Nobody said, I don't want that candidate. So I think that the town is very lucky to have such great candidates with ideas. And really, it's sort of up to us town manager, whoever, to figure out who we want. Like, um, and in the course of uh, these interviews, it occurred to me that we're asking them to do something in a town that's really very, very diverse. 
with all the diversity being in pockets and in small minority groups. And so it's quite, it's going to be quite a challenge to respond to um, the reasons why CRESS was created, according to the reports of Rizwana and others have cited. So I'll move, pass on to Jen to report on the chief of police search. Okay, so we, um... Everett Henry, who is the CS, who is on the CSSJC, is the chair of the police chief committee. So that's very nice. And we are, we, there were very few applicants. I think there were like four or five applicants at the very beginning. And so we expanded to include several um, other police organizations or I don't know exactly how to describe it, but like ways that police will find out about job opportunities that will bring us more diverse um, candidates and which it has. And so now I think we went from like four to five and now we have like 16. So that's much better. Um, and so we're now just reviewing those and we will be meeting, I believe the first week of February again to start the interview process. Um, but that is a very diverse group of folks on that hiring committee. It's very large. So there's the HR director, myself, the chief of the fire chief, Tim Nelson, then Tyrone, the police of chief in for UMass PD, um, Liz Haygood, and Tony Butterfield, the principal from Crocker Farm. So there's just, a, there's several people involved in that process, um, but it's good. And, and I would Ben Ezra too, from the Survival Center. I would say similarly, very diverse group for the uh, press director, like the head of uh, Craig's Doors was part of it. Um, the director of the Bang Center was part of it, Chief Nelson. Um, the I forgot his name, but the guy from the uh, after school who oversees the after school program for the middle school. I mean, I thought that was great. Um, Dwayne Shane, somebody like, yeah, Dwight, somebody like me. Um, I don't know. There were a couple more people, and of course, the human human uh, whatever she's called, human resources director. Um, so yeah, I think I was. I'm actually pretty impressed by the. Uh, scope of the search. I know that in the end, though, you know, it's going to be the town manager who decides, but he's not deciding in a vacuum. There's a lot of information that he has been open to receiving. Whether he's looking at it all, I have no idea, but he says he's receiving it. And the town, the town's commitment uh, to participating and contributing to the process also is really impressive to me because it was a lot of time, certainly for my time, and I only participated in about half the process. So, yeah. So then uh, there's a next item is the budget request. Um, I don't know if anyone has any information about that. I'm totally out of the loop on it. Uh, Liz, I know, has been following it. Um, I will take that to mean no information for now. We'll come back to it next time. Yeah, uh, the I affordable... Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say the only thing that I know is that, you know, Liz did attend that meeting and make their request. Uh, the other town departments are in the midst of starting the um, presenting our budgets uh, um, to the finance committee. So both uh, DEI and CRESS, um, the first part of the process to to uh, to submit a written narrative. And so um, those were due. It might have been due on January fifth, but um, so that those that first part has been um, submitted with some requests for a, additional finances or increases to the budget for both DEI DEI and CRESS. And then um, the way in which the process worked last year was that um, the finance department went you know, department by department in small meetings with people. So at some point I'll get, a, um, I'll get an, a, an appointment to, to meet to have a discussion around DEI. I think 
probably there will be a new director in um, by the time that the Crest Department um, has their meeting. And last year, Sean held the DEI and Crest Department meetings together because um, the former Crest Director and I were both new to the process. And it will probably be my suggestion that they pair us again, just because um, there's a little bit of, I can provide a little bit of assistance to the new Crest Director having you know been a part of the leadership team for this uh, for the last four months and then so that is moving along internally yeah so if we're fairly early in the budget process I'm thinking of Deb's suggestion about data collection and if there's a budget associated with that maybe we should squeeze that in because the process hasn't in in fullness begun yet if we still have time um I, I don't know what all is involved, Deb, but you know we'll have to. It would be good if we could get your help, DEI's help, in um, getting that inserted into the human rights budget or your budget or somebody's budget, so it's there. I'll do um, my best to create a proposal for next week by next week, so that to be timely for that, not just be timely for our next meeting. Meaning a um, proposal about what data collection would look like and how mm -hmm. so that would be great um, yeah. then the affordable housing trust who's reporting on that I think no that's report. typically been Liz uh-huh so there's no report for now and then the HRC bylaw um, the town manager did set up an appointment for Liz and me, and I'm good since Tyler's back, I'm going to ask to have Tyler included in that discussion as well with the lawyer directly so that any questions the lawyer has can be answered and discussed and the thing can be finalized and finally be done. Uh, Tyler, you have your hand up. Yeah, I'd be happy to um, join in mm -hmm. with that meeting. Um, yeah. Although I would need a, to know when it is ahead of time and then hopefully I can get it to work with my schedule, but I'm more flexible in January than during the school year. So okay. hopefully that can work out. Uh, my phone battery is about to die though. So I don't think that I'll be in the meeting for very much longer. Um, okay. But yeah. I'm going to email you the time and date. Um, and then if you can join, then I'm happy to propose to the town manager that you join us because you were so critical to writing the thing. Yeah, great. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Good. So that's where that is. And then I, th I think after that is when it goes to the town council. Um, and I have, I have had this, well, it doesn't matter. I think we just need to get the thing done. Um, so then the next item, I think we're near the end is upcoming events. I think uh, Pamela reported some on that. I don't know if you all want to add something. So the next event that is coming up will, if we're, um, will be uh, Black History Month on the February 1st, um, and then uh, Lunar New Year on February 17th. And if we're able to get facilitators, then um, a, the racial reconciliation, racial healing uh, conversation um, on probably February 28th, if we're able to to find facilitators for that, that conversation. Have I missed anything, Jennifer? No, I would maybe just go a little bit out because I'm going to have to start organizing like three other pretty really big events. So there's uh, AAPI Heritage Month. So I think that that is, um, can, is pretty big and the youth hero awards basketball tournament yeah. slash that. race amity day that is a really really fantastic event again you have a lot of cross sectional of all kinds of class race education um and so it's just a really nice event and then there's juneteenth so um those are three really big events. So I'm just going to throw it out there now, looking for some help to help mm -hmm. kind of with those events. I have to say that the roles I had in Juneteenth two years ago and last year in the Heroes Day, which I had no idea what it was, 
but everybody goes to that. And it's really an amazing look at the community that is Amherst. So I would really suggest that everyone come to that, Jacinta. Yeah, Sorry. I'm just gonna offer that, although I can't be there in person, I'd be happy to do any sort of communicated communication or emailing or like copy editing or just drafting that could help um, with that. Uh, those events. And then I wanted to add that um, there's at Amherst College, for, uh, there's a number of events uh, during Black History Month at Amherst, but the one that I'm usually involved in, I won't be there physically this year. And I'm not on the committee that runs it, but I just contribute art with other people. There's the Black Art Matters um, show that Amherst has. Um, and it should be in conjunction with the new Caribbean art show that they're having. Um, I forget the name of it, but it's by a Puerto Rican artist um, and curator. And then also Boundless, that's sort of a smaller show now. And I'm not sure if Elizabeth James Perry's Seeping In is still there, but um, I would be happy to share the communication for that that's happening with the Human Rights Committee and we can put it on whatever forum we have. <laughs> Um, but those are some events that if um, people wanted to find out about them through the Human Rights Committee, the the town in general. If those items are open to the public, um, which it seems like they are, then you can suggest to the organizers that they place it on the community calendar on the town website. And so people are already signed up to receive those notifications. So lots of folks will get um, an email blast about it or text. Okay. so. Could you repeat that? <laughs> I can email you the info tomorrow if you would like, because it's kind of a little bit of a step process, but I can help email that to you tomorrow. Yeah, I'd be happy to get that um, to the museum. Okay, so we're at the end of our agenda. It is eight o'clock. Got a lot done today. Uh, is there anything else that needs to be discussed today? In that case, I will say thank you all so much. I really do feel like we got a good bit done and happy new year again and see you next month. Um, Can you just call a the time? Meeting, yes. yes, the meeting is officially closed. It is 8.01 p.m. Perfect. Thank all you. Right, bye, bye Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Happy new year. Bye.